We believe in the power of the law to advance democracy, equity, and justice. It takes a collective effort to transform lives and protect the well-being of our communities. Let's renew our commitment to our shared ideals. Let's stand at the forefront of the issues of the day. Hello, I'm Mary Smith, President of the American Bar Association, with another episode of the ABA Presidential Speaker Series. Under the theme, Lifting Our Voices, Charting the Future, these fireside chats spotlight trailblazers shaping our collective future, inspiring thought, and fostering understanding of pressing global issues. I'm excited to present today's special Women's History Month program featuring Rosie Rios, Chair of America 250. Today's program will be moderated by Frederic Irwin, CEO of the National Women's History Museum. Fred? Thank you so much, Mary. I'm delighted to be here today with the Honorable Rosie Rios, who was appointed by President Joe Biden as chair of America 250, the United States Congressional Commission planning the 250th anniversary of the nation's founding in 2026. Rosie also served as the 43rd treasurer of the United States and initiated and led the efforts to place a portrait of a woman on US currency. Rosie, you have left a lasting impact on the nation's currency and financial institutions. I wanna share a few of those before we get started. You've spearheaded the campaign to depict women on U.S. quarters, introducing a series that includes notable figures like poet Maya Angelou and astronaut Sally Ride, among others. You champion the effort to feature Harriet Tubman on the $20 bill, a monumental move that slated for release in 2030. And last but not least, you've left a lasting mark. Your signature appears on 1.2 trillion of the 1.4 trillion in currency circulating globally today. As we mentioned, you're now serving in a new role. In July, 2022, you were designated as the chair for the United States Semi-Quincentennial Commission, the celebration in July, 2026 of America's 250th birthday. Today, I wanna to talk about what you first saw and then started with the Women on Quarters program as well as your vision for how the 250th can have a profound impact on the way that Americans see their future, and also the role the 250th anniversary can have in sharing women's history. So would you mind starting us off with the story of um, when you first, that moment you realized that women were not on any American currency? Thank you, Fred, and and, uh, and thank you to Mary as well for inviting me to participate today. I am thrilled to be here. Uh, you know, one of my big passions is is women, money, and power. And so, thinking about kind of celebrating women during Women's History Month, specifically as part of the uh, ABA, couldn't be more fitting. Uh, so, you know, my journey was really interesting in terms of what I call myself as an accidental feminist, accidental educator, accidental historian. My background's in finance. I was. Um, Living in my uh, life in the Bay Area in 2008, uh, managing director of this very large investment management firm. And then I received that call um, from a friend of mine who was in the Clinton administration. And one of her friends was heading up the uh, Treasury Federal Reserve Transition Team at the height of financial crisis in 2008. Should President Obama win, uh, they were looking for finance professionals to come in and, uh, and, and work on the transition with the current administration at the time. So if you can imagine, you know, the fall of 2008 was a, a very crazy time for, for, the, for the world. Our economic house was on fire. And, and so uh, I had just completed a $300 million capital raise when no one was raising money. Uh, and when uh, President Obama won in November of 2008, that was, um, you know, you can't really say no to that. So that was my 14 week vacation that I took uh, and it was really during that time, if you if you recall, it was um, you know one of the most consequential times of our economic history. And there were about two dozen of us who were uh, working closely with Secretary Paulson and President Bush's team to implement the legislation that Congress had just passed to put the economy back on track. So it was a very kind of high stress time. And uh, I don't remember a lot other than you know I didn't sleep, I didn't eat, and we reviewed materials after materials, making recommendations along the way. And so when I did have a break, which wasn't very often, I would literally tiptoe away 
to Treasury's Historical Resource Center. And uh, people wouldn't know this. Treasury didn't just produce currency. They actually produced all the financial products of the federal government, everything from savings bonds to military payment certificates. They still produce a security page for your passport. They produce food stamps. So all those renderings and drawings were in this resource center that was not open to the public. And I kind of, you know, I got, I felt like I won the lottery to be able to have access to many of the things that haven't been seen by anyone alive. Uh, and it was in that period of kind of heightened stress, heightened awareness, where I kind of saw a pattern after a while of going in there. Um, and I realized that on almost every document that I came across, every woman depicted on these products were, weren't real women, they were allegorical. Uh, sometimes, you know, like Lady Liberties, sometimes wearing togas and sometimes no togas. But every man that I came across was a real man, a founding father, or a cabinet member, or president. And, and that was really my awakening when I kind of took a look around and, you know, looked at our historical currency and realized that we had never had the portrait of a woman on our Federal Reserve notes in the history of our country. Did a little bit more research. And this was, by the way, December of 2008, because I remember the big light bulb coming up um and and uh, i did a little bit of homework and i at that time there were uh, almost 30 countries who had women on their modern day currency so i asked the bureau of engraving and printing director who would eventually report to me and his deputy and his deputy the same question why haven't we ever had the portrait of a woman on our federal reserve notes and they and they, they all had the same answer individually some form of the answer which was ready for this no one's ever brought it up <laughs> now you know, that was, that was, uh, that answer was everything. And, and again, you know, if we are the leader of the free world, literally, as we are about to commemorate the founding of our democracy, how could it be that we both overlooked 50% of our population in kind of institutionalizing our history on these products? So, you know, that was, um, that was really my number one motivator when I was asked to be part of the permanent uh, team for President Obama, there, of the two dozen, about half a dozen of us were recommended, and I was one of them. And, and it was a tough decision because, you know, my, my daughter was eight, my son was 12. I loved my life in California. My mom, my siblings were here, my friends. But, you know, when you when you get that call to action, that that inspirational moment, um, I, I found my calling. I really found my purpose in life. Uh, and so I was nominated by, and I chose Treasury United States intentionally. Because one, um, I would be able to have access to the Bureau of Engraving and Printing in the U.S. Mint. Two, I requested that I be appointed as a senior advisor to the secretary so that I would be part of his morning meetings, et cetera. And then I uh, also asked for a very specific role to be chair of the Advanced Counterfeit Deterrent Steering Committee. This is, only, this is the only formal collaborative that includes Federal Reserve, Secret Service, and Treasury specifically on the future of our currency design. And as mm. chair, I would be the only person in the world who would make that final recommendation to the Secretary of the Treasury who has the final say, not the president, not Congress, that's the law. So, um, so it was very strategic, why I wanted the role. Uh, and it was very deliberate to relocate my family from the only life they ever knew to this foreign land of Washington, DC to start working on this. And and uh, I have no regrets, absolutely none whatsoever. And I am a very, very different person uh, from the time that I, I took, from the time that I had that enlightenment, if you will. I love that. And of course we're celebrating Women's History Month. So this story in light of so many American women's history being largely overlooked in our history and of course on our currency um, could not be more relevant right now, but just in general. Um, I, I'm dying to know, once you had that moment, um, what did you do? What were the next steps? How did you um, start the process of what today we know as the Women on Quarters program? Yeah, so, you know, I kept it very close hold. I didn't want it to get leaked in the press. Uh, I didn't want it to get political. I, I wanted it to follow the path of how currency design is normally uh, uh, normally studied and normally uh, kind of recommended and then implemented. So it was a very, very specific process that I went through. In, and it's the same process I would go through with even analyzing an investment, right? So, you know, case study, precedent, analysis, 
recommendation implementation. It was a very, very specific process. And I also knew that I, I had to obviously engage the secretary. Uh, and it took a while. You know, the way uh, currency is redesigned, the number one reason is for security purposes, anti-counterfeiting. And so, you know, every denomination has a different set of, of, of um, overt and uh, covert security features based on the denomination. The higher the denomination, the more features it has. But the real underlying kind of interest for me was how to think about this, not about women for the sake of women, but how to think about this as kind of a, you know, a, a, a bigger kind of aha moment for our country. And, and so every generation of currency has a theme. So for example, if you've seen the, the new hundred dollar bill that has the blue security ribbon going down the middle, that was the last denomination of that generation of notes. And by the way, that, 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 uh, uh, security ribbon took 14 years to develop. So again, it's a very, very specific and technical process. Uh, and so uh, that generation of notes, the, uh, the, the theme for that is symbols of freedom. So why is that important? Because when the first note was issued in, uh, in, in uh, 2002, the $20 bill was issued in 2002, um, you'll see that uh, that on these denominations, you'll see, for example, the, the quill of the Declaration of Independence on the, uh, on the $100 bill. You'll see the torch from the Statue of Liberty on the $10 bill. So when it was released in 2002, uh, you know, that was post 9-11. Uh, so what better way to remind our country on the values in which it were founded than symbols of freedom? Uh, and so again, that was intended to represent what's happening at that moment in time. For me, uh, what I thought was going to be significant was how this theme was going to be selected for this next generation of currency. And so, again, it's supposed to represent what that moment in time was happening. And so when you think about, you know, when I came on board at the height of the financial crisis, uh, you know, it, it was, it was uh, you know, that turned our world upside down. It was also kind of the advent of the mass scale use of social media, right? Some would say, you know, look, we had our first African-American president elected in our country ever. And some would say that was with you know, this whole new world of, of, of Facebook, et cetera. And it wasn't just happening here domestically, right? What was happening in terms of this kind of, you know, social media phenomenon was happening overseas, right? Giving a voice to the voiceless, whether it was the Arab Spring, whether, you know, what was happening in Turkey, this uprising, if you will, was very real. And, and so, you know, using kind of that technology and that tool to give a voice that otherwise wouldn't have happened you know, was was really kind of part of my thinking, but it was kind of this other step, which was I realized as we were coming up with our schedule, again, a very technical schedule on how these security and design components are integrated. It dawned on me that when we were supposed to unveil the first note was 2020. Remember, this is back in 2009, 2010, right? And it dawned on me, 2020, wait a minute, that's the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment granting women the right to vote. What better way to think about you know, giving half your population the ability to participate in the governance process, then this theme of democracy. So that's how this theme of democracy for this generation of notes came into being. It wasn't a woman for the sake of a woman. It was again, kind of what was happening in this movement of, of, of really a change of our culture, American and global culture through these voices that have never been heard before. And so that's mm -hmm. how it became about a woman was this theme of democracy. And by the way, uh, when we did uh, make this presentation, this formal presentation to Secretary Geithner in 2012, um, and using the reasoning that I just presented to you, uh, his first response, I'll never forget, is October 2012. Uh, his first response after this very lengthy presentation was, this is cool, we should do this. So, <laughs> and, and you know, I, I, I do think, um, his inspiration is probably the same for, for me. It's probably the same for many of us, which is, you know, I'll never forget um, uh, when I, we, I first had our, our Women in Finance Symposium. And I'll, I'll never forget, and that was something that I started in, uh, in March of, of, uh, of 2010. I was briefing him uh, the Friday before, the event was gonna be on a Monday. And it was fabulous, it was exactly the way it should have been. And, and uh, as I was briefing him, he said to me, he says, you know, my daughter Elise, who at the time was an undergrad at Stanford, my daughter Elise is in town this weekend. I wonder if I, should, if I could get her to change her flight so she can stay 
for the event on Monday. And that was really a big kind of light bulb for me, thinking to myself, he understands the importance of what it means to have representation and voices, all voices at the table. And in this case, obviously, it was very much about having his daughter be part of that event, that Women in Finance event, the first ever in Treasury. And, and so I, I kind of knew at that moment, back in 2010, that he was, uh, he was open. He was open to the possibilities of what our future could hold based on what our history was. Um, and so, look, I, I give him a lot of credit for, for taking the risk, the first one, really, to take that risk with me. Well, it sounds like it's not just the Women on Porters program. It's this whole theme of democracy that you were thinking about that really contributed to enhancing the public recognition and appreciation of women's achievements in American history. I'm wondering, are you? do you hope that the Women's Quarters Program, which uh, maybe you could tell us a little bit more about where it is right now in terms of um, the quarters that have been released and what year we're in and how many more, um, but do you hope to see that program address some historical omissions and inspire future generations as you just shared with that story? Absolutely. And, and look, it's not just about coining currency, right? I mean, if you think about, let's start with currency for a second. If you think, if you go around the world, you will always, almost always see a, a similar format for how currency works, right? So it's usually a very important person in the front and on the back is some mo uh, monument edifice event. Uh, and, and that is how we institutionalize our history, right? That is a formal process of institutionalizing our history, at least from Treasury's perspective. And look, Treasury was the first thing that George Washington, you know, set up when he became president in 1789. That was Alexander Hamilton appointed as Secretary of the Treasury. So that was, you know, everything originated basically in Treasury. So for us, again, leader of the free world, this theme of democracy, how could it be, you know, and, and, and once your eyes are open in that way, you know, people ask me all the time, you know, when I get this fun question, what is your superpower? My superpower is I see the invisible. I know what's missing. So I'll talk about the quarters program in a second, but you know, part of that journey that I had, and I was in the, in the administration for eight years. I was the longest serving senior treasury official in the Obama administration because it was important for me to see this project um, on its way. And you recall, we, we led a very ambitious, unprecedented effort to engage the public in this. So in June of 2015, we launched uh this this kind of nationwide feedback process through social media through letters emails roundtables etc to solicit feedback on who should be considered for our, our currency and that was another awakening there was a lot of resistance there was an enormous amount of resistance uh, and in some cases anger um that we are changing things and and it was it was interesting and that really opened up my eyes you know the more you're gonna kind of put that in front of me, it's just going to fuel my fire. It's not going to stop me. It's going to make me work even harder. So um, one of the last things I, I did in the administration was I proposed this legislation uh, to, to put women on our quarters. And, um, and it, you know, it, it, it took a while and it was the end of the administration. So, you know, it was, it was hard. It was hard. But that, you know, once the administration was over, that wasn't going to stop me. Uh, thankfully, I had the support of Congresswoman Barbara Lee, uh, we worked very, very hard on this for, for five years. Five years we worked on this legislation uh, until it was uh, finally passed by Congress in, in 2020. It was technically called the Circulating Collectible Coin Redesign Act of 2020. Um, and, it, and it evolved. It was an, it originally intended to be a 10-year program specifically focused on, on women on quarters, um, the same way most of the uh, um, quarters programs have been 10 year programs. So we've had, you know, America, the beautiful quarter series. We've had our kind of, um, uh, you know, state quarters, et cetera. And they're usually 10 year programs. Uh, so, so, uh, in this case, you know, it did evolve to include other, other, other constituencies. And look, I'm thrilled. I'm absolutely thrilled that it passed. I'm ab absolutely thrilled that it was signed. Uh, and it's a 10 year program, but it's, as you, as you probably know, it's, it's, um, uh, four years of, of five women per year on quarters. So, so 20 women total. And then it turns into one year of quarters. In fact, all, circula all circulating coins will be redesigned for the semi-quincentennial, the 250th in 2026. Then it's followed by four years of youth sports, which I absolutely love um, because you're going to find that everything that I do has a physical component. So 
the youth for this part of the of the coin act was very very important because what, what do kids collect these days what do kids collect they collect Hard. likes Baseball. well likes and followers is mostly what they collect right in my, day, my day you know or, or or you know or video hits i don't know but in my day you know we collected coins we collected baseball cards we collected uh, rocks i collected gum wrappers and made chains out of them and so you know when you touch something your brain synapses work in a very different way. You actually get into what I call the third dimension, right? That emotional intelligence kind of sparks up when you actually physically interact with something. So everything I do has a physical component, always, always, always. So this notion of youth sports for four years, both my kids were, were varsity athletes. The thought of, of, of kids going out there and finding their sport and collecting their sport is so key. They get to touch it. They get to see themselves, right? That's the whole purpose. Boys and girls get to see themselves. And then, and that goes to, to, to 2030. And the last part of the legislation also gives the Mint the ability to produce uh, the um, uh, the medals for the Olympics. So, so again, it, it evolved. I was thrilled with the evolution. Again, my whole point was to get this passed and well on its way. And, and you know, yes, I mean, the, when that first coin came out, the first quarter with Maya Angelou, Oh, I can't tell you. Um, you know, I, 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 I've shared many private moments with a lot of people who have expressed their 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 disbelief that it took so long. And look, you know, we still don't have a woman on our paper currency, right? But here's the takeaway from all of that. So we are now in our we're just started our third year of these women on quarters, um, and 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 it's been amazing. And you know, there's a whole selection process that happens. Uh, we, with these congressionally appointed entities. Of course, the National Women's History Museum is part of that, which I couldn't be more grateful to you, Fred, uh, for all your support over the years. You've been amazing. Um, uh, and so there's a process in place, in, including members of Congress, uh, where, where recommendations are made. Uh, there's a design process that happens at the Mint. Uh, and then there's also a Citizens Coinage Advisory Committee uh, that works with the Mint. Uh, to finalize that. And then ultimately, by law, it's the Secretary of the Treasury who approves the final design. So we're in the you know full swing of this. Um, and, and I couldn't be more grateful that, that I had this experience. You know, I never in a million years thought I would ever work in the federal government. But here I am now, you know, in my fourth tour of duty, if you will. Uh, and I have yeah. no regrets. It, it only inspires me to do more. There's so much more to do. I think what's amazing, Rosie, is you could have stopped right there. Right. And what you've done, and yes, the National Women's History Museum has been so delighted to work in partnership with the Mint to release these quarters together, to research and, and be part of the process of determining who, which women would be on it. But what's amazing to me, and what I really want to start talking about, is this new role that you took on in July 2022, I believe. Um, and as we mentioned, on July 4th, 2026, the U.S. is going to be celebrating its 250th birthday. And so now you've been, been designated the chair for the U.S. Semi-Centennial Commission. And um, I want to hear your vision. But maybe what we should do before we do that is watch the, the video that was produced. Um, because I think that really is such a beautiful video that lays kind of the, the as you said, like the 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 experience, the storytelling, and then maybe you can share your vision. But let's take a minute and watch the video. After 247 years, you could say, I've seen some things. Building a democracy from scratch it isn't easy. Or being home to hundreds of millions from everywhere on earth. Fact is, there have been challenges since the very beginning. Uphill battles, setbacks, and injustices. But you know, Americans, we got grit. We fight for what we need. And what's right. what we want for the next generation. We take care of each other when it gets rough. We inspire each other. Innovate to 
together. Get the job done. And create so much opportunity. Heck, it's probably why folks have been inspired to come here for so long. And now, we've got a pretty big anniversary coming up. The Big 250. So, in honor of that, we're launching America's Invitation. A chance to share your thoughts on our past, the heroes you love, and your dreams for the road ahead. Because your dreams will be our future. Your story is the American story. Rosie, tell us a little bit about your vision in, in this role. What, what led you to take this role? Well, um, I was appointed by Senator Schumer uh, in 2018 on this commission. And, and you know, it, it took a while to kind of get up and running. You know, we went through a pandemic, obviously. Um, and so uh, you know, there, 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 was, um, there was a lot to do in terms of trying to figure out exactly what this was going to be. And, you know, technically it's the 250th anniversary of the signing of the Declaration of Independence. Our country existed long before that in different forms. Uh, but certainly when we became kind of our current uh, kind of governance, uh, 1776 obviously was the, was the, the start of that, of that period. Um, but, but you saw from, the, from the, the video, which was produced for our first public initiative called America's Invitation, we are not shying away from our very complicated history. You know, it's what I call the good, the bad, and the ugly. There, there's a lot to it. Um, there's a lot of sacrifice that was, uh, that was done by a lot of people, um, those who were already here, uh, those who were, who were brought here by force, and, and those who fought uh, for that independence from, from Great Britain. There's been an enormous amount of sacrifice. And those stories really, in my opinion, haven't really been told in a way that I think we're now ready to tell those stories. The, you know, the pandemic really caused a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of awakenings along the way, whether it was the Me Too movement, whether the Black Lives Matters, whether it was, you know, the, the suffrage centennial. And, 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 you know, human behavior is very, very hard to change unless there's a jolt to, to our system. And that was the big jolt. Those conversations that have taken so long to come to the forefront. I mean, look, we as women have always known how difficult it's been. Right in the workplace, et cetera. We've all felt it. And 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 for those who, you know, who have daughters or you know have wives, talk to them. We've all felt being held back in some way, shape, or form. Uh, and so I, I do believe that we're ready now for that journey. And and we we launched this count-up, this three-year count-up, this last July 4th, 2023, as part of a light touch to invite the public to take this journey with us. And again, that, that video was so difficult because you can probably see it's, it's nonpartisan, it's all partisan, it's bipartisan, it's whatever you wanna call it, but we wanted to make sure that every, as many voices as possible could be represented in that process. And again, we're not shying away from it. And so, um, you know, that, that, you know I, I have this great team and this great team has very different perspectives. And, I, and when I give them an assignment, I don't wanna know how the sausage, sausage is made. I just wanna know that we're all gonna agree on the outcome, right? So were, you know, did your voice get represented? And that is what I think happened in this video. I, I, you know, I have yet to hear anything negative about this video because we tried so hard to get it right. And I think we did. And that video was launched uh, as part of America's Invitation last July 4th at the Milwaukee Brewers against the Chicago Cubs game in Wisconsin. Nice purple state, middle of the country. This was not intended to be about the coasts. This was not intended to be about 13 colonies. This was intended to be about middle America in every sense of the word. And, and we want everyone to feel like this is of the people, by the people, people, for the people. This is about Main Street. This is about, again, the untold stories that we know exist. This is about going where history actually actually happened. And this is also about going where people perhaps have been forgotten. And, and it's a reminder, right? These are all reminders on the values in which our country was founded. And more importantly, 
how to provide those platforms for all those all those voices to come together. So, you know, what I love about America's Invitation, which is an evergreen process where people could submit their videos on what America means to them, maybe ideas for 2026. One of my favorites to date is uh, this video of this family sitting around the piano, composing a song about what America means to them. And for some people it might be, you know, just complete patriotism. For some people it might be hesitation. For some people it might be very specific policy issues. And, and that's great. We're gonna, you know, we're gonna show as much as we can, as much as we have the ability to do on this three year journey that by the way, is absolutely not gonna be done in 2026. Everything that we're doing, we're trying to figure out how to make it evergreen, how to make it continue, how to work with partners who know how to continue some of these initiatives. So I, you know, it's been thrilling for me. I never in a million years thought that I would do what I'm doing now, but when I got, got that call from the White House in, uh, in the spring of, of 2022 to take over as chair, um, you know, again, you can't really say no to these opportunities. And, <laughs> and, uh, and I, again, I have no regrets, but it has become what I didn't realize it would become as my full-time endeavor. And, and again, I, I'm, I'm enjoying every minute. Well, I feel that we're all so lucky to have you in this role because I think that seeing the 250th anniversary really as an opportunity to reflect on this comprehensive view of, of our history, of our American history is wonderful. Um, if you don't mind, we've gotten a few questions from the audience that I wanted to pepper in, if that's okay. Specifically, the first one from Carol Corbin Walker, chair of the ABA Commission on Women in the Profession. Carol? In your career, you have always been at the forefront of promoting women. As the nation moves towards its 250th anniversary, what role do you see for women attorneys? I think that's a fabulous question. I mean, look, the way, the way I think about women in every profession, and, and as I mentioned, you know, women in positions of money and power, that's my thing. In addition to the physical representation of historical American women, women in positions of money and power is my, those are, those are my two passions. I live and breathe those two concepts all the time and integrate it into everything that I do. So you can't have a discussion about our history without talking about 51% of our population. So absolutely, women are gonna be at the forefront of this commemoration celebration journey that we're all taking together. Now, when you think about women in law, and, 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 and you know, I know the ABA does a fabulous job of documenting and tracking uh, specifically women's role in the legal profession. Um, I can guarantee you, I don't know what the exact number is, but I can get, I, I, I had tracked this at, at one point, I haven't seen the latest number, but I can guarantee you that that uh, it's at least half lawyers out there are women, at least. But I'm sure that uh, 20 something percent are actually equity partners. So why do I say that? Because women happen to flatline at 20 something percent and almost every social, economic, and political indicator. I, I guarantee you that's gonna be the case for equity law partners. And it's a very sad thing to recognize. I that was just my own, my own homework. This is my own study, my own research. But if you look at whether it's women in Congress, whether it's women in the C-suite, whether it's women on boards, whether it's uh, uh, female governors, female mayor, it's almost always 20 something percent. Now, the only change that has happened of any significance of any of those indicators was women on corporate boards, where it's now, it, it actually broke 30%. Now, why did that happen? Because of legislation in some states, right? California, et cetera. So, and that was because, you know, we had our little blip of the suffer centennial. It, mm -hmm. We need more than a blip. So I would say that if I were a female attorney, I would love to figure out kind of what the the line in the sand is going to be, what can we accomplish by 2026? We don't have the lift of the suffer centennial anymore. I wish we did. But I want to use 2026 as the next kind of, you know, the next the next milestone for what we can do to improve our own respective areas. And so for all of you female attorneys out there, I guarantee you the equity partners are in the 20 something percent because that is the case for almost every other major leadership position for women. So how do you move that needle? between now and 2026. Use that as your new your new pledge. I pledge that I'm gonna move the needle and there's gotta be, and the ABA obviously can play a very, very significant role in how that happens. 
I love that. Inspiring them to aspire to to more and to setting their own their own history and telling their own stories. Absolutely. So, well, look, I mean, change only happens when we don't settle. That's the only way change happens, right? I wasn't settling for anyone and I still don't. And and, mm -hmm. and that's the only way you're going to move the needle. Look, it's not about me. It absolutely is about my daughter. No doubt in my mind. And, you know, and, and my son, look, this is what I say. Boys will be fine. Our daughters have to climb. It's true. It's absolutely yeah. true. So if you want to move the needle, and, and this is the other part, it's not just about women. If 80% of the decision makers are men, because again, that 20%, 20 something percent rule, if 80% are men, how do you think change is going to happen? We absolutely need the men as part of this decision making, right? So that's why Secretary Geithner's role was so key. Most of my champions have been men with daughters. I know people don't like when I say that, but that is the truth. If you're going to make change, it's going to have to be changed by the decision makers. So again, this is this is this is a partnership. This is absolutely uh, you know something. Again, we're all in this together. This isn't just about women doing tea circles trying to get it done. It's not going to happen. It has to be substantive. It has to be a collective voice, and it has to be you know awareness and action. Well, our next question is a little bit more specific, but it reminds me of a quote you once said. So before I toss it over to um, our audience member. You once said, um, Black history is American history, Mexican history is American history, and women's history is American history. So this question that I'm going to um, invite Deandra Benali, who is the commissioner of the ABA Commission on Women in the Profession, submitted this following question. What role will Native Americans, specifically Native American women, play in the 250th anniversary celebration? Oh, that's a great question. I and mean, look, this has been an issue for me for a long time. My, my parents are from Mexico. My parents came to the US in 1958 uh, in uh, the town of Hayward, California, because uh, my dad was a seasonal worker at the Hunt's Tomato Factory. Uh, so this is where I live today in the East Bay, in, in the Bay Area. Um, but when you think about California, uh, and 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 what it was in in 1776, you know, it, it was Mexico, right? So so you know, for me, you know, the, obviously that that indigenous world of which I am, um, you know, my 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 both my parents had in, had indigenous backgrounds. Um, you know, I I I feel it. it's obviously not the same experience as as what um, what happened, you know, in in in, in most of the country here. Um, at least not that I'm aware of in terms of my ancestors, but, but look, I mean, those stories need to be told. And, and, and again, it's, 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 it is about women, but it's about all the voices being heard. But, but if you think about, you know, this is why, you know, even coming back to the quarters, you know, when we had Wilma Mankiller uh, on one of the, the, fir the first year of those quarters, you know, she was the first uh, uh, female chief of, of, of the Cherokee nation. Um, it was very, very significant to have her represented because, you know, that paves the way, that sets the tone about what our possibilities are. And, and you know, I'll, I'll never forget, it's actually Gloria Steinem who said to me that she would have loved to have seen Wilma Mankiller as, as the, the woman on the, the paper money. She's a very big champion of hers, but, um, you know, that, that, that is significant. And so, again, those are some of the stories, when you hear those stories, um, you know, makes a difference or, or, or um, you know, Maria Tallchief uh, came out last fall, the first uh, uh, American prima ballerina who was from the Osage Nation. You know, that, that, that is significant for all the future, um, you know, everyone who wants to, to kind of find their, their, their own, make their mark, find their own niche, whether it's in the arts, whether it's in the leadership position, you know, that is something very, very significant. But, but it also continues today. Look, our, our sponsoring um, um, agency for the 250 is actually the, the, the Department of the Interior. The secretary is Deb Halland, who is, a, of course, another, another you know, indigenous leader. She's been amazing, a true, a, a true inspiration for all of us. Our, our current treasurer, Lynn Malerba. Uh, the first ever uh, indigenous treasurer of the United States. I, I adore her. And also, by the way, she was the, 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 the former head of the Mohegan Nation, first woman to head the, the Mohegan Nation. And, and even one of our other, um, other counterparts, uh, Shelley Lowe, who's the chair of the National Endowment for the Humanities, 
also indigenous. I mean, look, you know, we have leaders in the field out there and, and, and we certainly have no intention of doing any of this alone. And so, you know, as you go out into the real world, which of course we will continue to do, and, and, and you probably know that Mary Smith, uh, uh, the, the president of the ABA is, is also one of our ambassadors uh, for America 250. And, and so, you know, these voices, are, are voices of people who, who, you know, who need to be heard, who most people probably wouldn't even know exist, but who have to be, you know, this isn't just our, about our, our past. This is about our present. And more importantly, this is about our future. So how do we use history to inspire this next generation of leadership? And the leaders are there. It really is, you know, this, this awareness and this action that I'm talking about. Look, I mean, we're talking about the Women on Quarters series. If you look up the Women on Quarters, you're not gonna find my name. Right. I mean, this is just how history happens. Right. He who holds the pen usually makes history, usually writes the history. Right. And so part of what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to write history as in R-I-G-H-T. Right. Mm -hmm. you, you, you literally have to write the wrongs of the omissions of what's happened in our past, but really highlight those who are making a difference today. Right. This kind of recognition and connect, recognizing those who came before us, but connecting those who are in leadership positions today, of which we have many indigenous leaders. And then again, thinking about that as a way to inspire the future, that is really my mission, my goal for America 250, is to, to bring all those three pieces, the recognition, connection, connection, and inspiration to life. I wanna hit pause and say that I really appreciate this correlation that you're describing between your vision for an inclusive 250th celebration, inclusive of so many histories, and your vision for the Women on Quarters program. It's really just a, a beautiful legacy and story that you're building um, to showcase and make sure that these untold stories are not only read and heard, but more importantly, seen. So thank you for that. Um, and touched, right? And touched. And touched. Exactly. Exactly. You know, so as we consider our, our American identity today, and as we think about um, the 250th anniversary, specifically the 250th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence, um, I want to ask a question about your view of the role of lawyers in the upcoming anniversary. I mean, we talked about the role of uh, women attorneys just in general, but really kind of in terms of perhaps educating the public about the constitution, about the declaration of independence, why is this moment significant? What would so you that, tell those, all of them, not just women attorneys? Yeah, no, that's a that's a great question. I mean, look, our, 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 our country was, you know, founded literally by, by, you know, by this governance process. And, and, you know, if you think about it this year, 2024 is the 250th anniversary of the first Continental Congress, right? They, they, they couldn't get it right the first time. They had to, you know, get the Senate, second Continental Congress. And, and a lot of people, it's interesting when you think about our history and, and what folks, you know, you're, what you're taught in school, but it's amazing what people either don't remember or never learned about the process of how we became this country that we are today. In terms of this governance, right? So, you know, again, this, 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 um, it really kicked off. You know, we, we just commemorated the the 250th anniversary of the Boston Tea Party in in this last December, and then there, you know, of course, a series of of battles all over, you know, South Carolina, Boston, um, uh, you know, Philadelphia, of course, um, New York, you know, parts of the country that that had all these major, major milestones, but, but. The, the the charters of freedom. So, you know, the, the charter of freedom include the Bill of Rights, the Declaration of Independence, and the Constitution. They all didn't happen at the same time. And and you know, that first Continental Congress played a very significant role in teeing up, if you will, you know, how how this governance was going to work. And if you think about it, we 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 declared independence in in, in 1776. But our constitution wasn't ratified until 1788. And George Washington became president in 1789. There's a lot of years there. There's a lot of years. It didn't happen overnight. And that, you know, that that kind of those were legal documents. Those were legal documents that had to be uh, construed and had to be obviously agreed upon and edited. And you have amendments now. And so, you know, that amendment process 
that constitutional process is so important. And, and, and I think this is the right time, if anything, for lawyers, the legal profession in general, to play a very significant role in reminding us how process, how due process actually works. And what better way to do that than to think about, again, what we had to go through as a country to become the country we are today. And, and you know, as I think about, for example, even, you know, I've met so many people who've taken the oath of citizenship. Naturalization mm -hmm. ceremonies are gonna be a big part of what we're doing. In fact, we did that as part of our Boston Tea Party commemoration in December. It was amazing. I actually was the keynote speaker at Daniel Hall where 338 people from 77 different countries took the oath of citizenship. That building only holds 700 people. It literally spilled out into the, the outside of the building, hundreds of family members who were all there wanting to see their family member become a US citizen. And that process, you know, these people had to take a test and it's amazing how many people cannot pass that test today uh, you know, on the street. So, you know, look, it, it is a legal process and, and, you know, more so now today, um, especially with the eyes on the Supreme Court, et cetera, I think the legal profession could play a very constructive role in perhaps revisiting how we became a country, the documents and the charters of freedom that, that, that have laid the groundwork for that. You know, again, I don't want this to be done in 2026. We still have a whole other series of 250th anniversaries leading up to the Constitution. So, so I think this is a, that opportunity to revisit our history and understand the importance. And look, you know, maybe there'll be more constitutional amendments. Who knows? Maybe the ERA. But, uh, <laughs> but, but now more than ever. Well, I can remember personally both of my parents going and taking their naturalization test. So I, I know what you mean. It is an incredibly sacred moment and part of our our history, all of us. Um, we're running a little low on time, but before we wrap up, I do want to um, address one last question, if you don't mind. This one is from Judge James Lockme, Chief Judge, retired, South Carolina Court of Appeals, and a member of the ABA Board of Governors. Chief Judge? Historically, we see that lawyers were not initially accepted in many American colonies. In fact, some had laws that banned charging anything for legal services. But by the time of the American Revolution, lawyers had become well-respected and depended upon by so many as we saw independence from Great Britain. Almost half of the delegates that adopted the Declaration of Independence were lawyers and were key in drafting that document that represents to the world our legal reasons and authority to leave England and take our place as a new nation in the world. Indeed, a decade later, 34 of the 55 delegates were lawyers who adopted the United States Constitution. So it is clear lawyers were crucial in declaring our freedoms and establishing the rule of law in this country. So as we now begin to celebrate and recognize our 250th anniversary of freedom and the rule of law, where are lawyers in the framework of our nation today? In your view, are we essential for the protection of the freedoms that have inspired so many Americans to give that last full measure of devotion in the past and stand watch for us today? A very good question. Uh, so the answer is absolutely. So, I mean, just look at the numbers. I'm a numbers person. So uh, over half of our presidents to date, so we're on our, we're on our 45th president, over half of them have been lawyers. Um, in Congress, it's less than half. I think it's, I think it hovers at 40%, maybe less than 40% for Congress today. They're legislators, right? It's legislation. These are legal documents that need to be drafted. They need to be, uh, debated and then they need to be passed or not passed. So absolutely in terms of, of kind of, you know, civics, how government works, the three branches of government, et cetera. And by the way, we're one of the few organizations act, act out there that actually have all three branches of government uh, represented, oh, yeah. mission, including the Supreme Court. Uh, you know, look, and as I mentioned already, the Supreme Court, everyone's eyes are on them today. I mean, who would have thought how relevant so many of the decisions that are being made today, how impactful they are. So, so absolutely the, the, the rule of law, the process of law, the education 
of, of how our government works. Um, you're probably not old enough to remember Schoolhouse Rock. I remember that. Like I do. Was, I, I do. <laughs> I remember how a bill was made. Remember that? Yes. Uh, and just a bill on Capitol yeah, Hill. Of exactly. Course. Exactly. So maybe, you know, maybe we, maybe Pixar could do an up, an, an updated version of that. I don't know. But, but, you know, again, look, we are still a country based on this system of governance and the legal process to become that, you know, the leader of the free world. We still are the leader of the free world. And, and to retain that, I think it's going to be, you know, something that that we all have to be involved in. The three words that drive our programming for America 250 is uh, educate, engage, unite. That education is going to be a big part of it. You know, that is one thing we can do as a congressional commission. We can pass legislation. Maybe it is that we're going to pass legislation that says we think that civics education, social studies should be a priority for this country again and leave it up to the states to decide how that's going to be implemented. So, you know, there's a lot of, of, of strength in numbers here. And, and, and look, we got to continue being that collective voice. I see a very, very strong role for the ABA in all of this moving forward. Yeah, I love that. Strength in numbers, you know, alliances. That's how we make things happen. So, Rosie, before we finish, I just want to say, you know, you've been described by so many as a pioneer, a trailblazer and a visionary and at the National Women's History Museum, we often say that living history is history. And you really are an example, an incredible example of a woman making history today. And so for all the future women and girls, I just want to say thank you for what you've done and what you're doing and what you will be doing, not just through 2026, but also beyond. So thank you for your time today. And I will um, give it back over to Mary. Thank you. Thanks so much, Fred, and thanks so much, Rosie, for this great conversation. Stay tuned for our next ABA Presidential Speaker Series. The topic is the Tulsa Race Massacre of 1921, one of the darkest chapters of our nation's history. Hear from Mother Randall, one of the two remaining survivors, and her lawyers, and they will discuss their quest for justice. And consider joining the American Bar Association at ambar.org slash membership. Thanks so much for joining us today.